AI is becoming more important as it moves out of the cloud and into real-world devices. Thanks to better hardware and smarter model optimization, running AI on local devices, both edge devices and embedded systems, is now faster, more efficient, and way more doable than it used to be. In this video, I want to briefly go over what Edge AI is and where it's used, but I also want to cover it from a more practical standpoint. How does developing AI for an Edge processor differ from other AI applications? And what does this mean for your AI workflow? I hope you stick around for it. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. All right, let's start with a definition. What is Edge AI? And simply put, Edge AI refers to AI models that run on Edge computers. And to understand what an Edge computer is, we have to talk about embedded processors and cloud computers. Embedded processors are the small specialized computer chips built into the device itself to perform dedicated functions. Edge computers are more powerful devices that aren't embedded in the device, but are still located relatively close by. And cloud computers are remote servers accessed over the internet where you can store data and run applications. So we have these three tiers of computers, and the software for a single system could be spread out across all three of them. For example, a security camera could have an embedded processor with code that manages the camera settings and then pre-processes the video. This video, along with video from other local cameras, could be sent to an edge computer where they further refine the images and run motion detection algorithms. Now, if motion is detected, then that snippet of video could be sent to a cloud computer for broader distribution to the end users. So we have a choice of where we want to run non-AI software components in our system. And similarly, we have that same choice when it comes to where to run our AI models. And here, by the way, I'm not talking about where we're going to train an AI model. I'm only talking about using a trained model for inference. Do we want the model to run in the cloud? Do we want it to run on the edge or embedded in the device? Now, of course, the answer depends on your system and what you're trying to accomplish, right? For example, if you're developing a system that is largely software centric with massive AI models and you need to access it from anywhere in the world, then it might make the most sense to deploy to the cloud. Like, for example, a bank fraud detection algorithm that has to connect to hundreds of banks across a large area. But a lot of AI these days aren't these types of systems. Many AI applications are physical systems that also happen to have AI components. And since the AI models are used to make real-time decisions, there's benefits to keeping your AI models as close to the device as possible by running them on embedded and edge computers. And some examples that highlight this include things like a virtual sensor. A common application is a battery state of charge estimator. An AI model could be used to estimate the state of charge, and then depending on the state, the system could take real-time actions to protect against things like over-discharging. Or another example is anomaly detection and predictive maintenance. Using time series data, an AI model could look for anomalous conditions in the system, which could trigger some automated intervention, like turning something off quickly or changing some parameters in a fault-tolerant controller. Or even power tools, like cordless drills, that can use an AI model to recognize situations where the drill bit may bind and quickly reduce power before the torque kicks the drill out of the user's hands. Now, in each of these situations, there are benefits to running the AI model on edge and embedded computers rather than on the cloud. So what are some of those reasons? Well, the first is reduced latency. Sending data across the internet to a cloud server and then receiving a response after your model runs takes time. And for safety critical systems where the device needs to take action as quickly as possible, that latency might add an unsafe amount of delay to the response. Another benefit are the reduced bandwidth requirements for the system. And this is especially important for systems that generate a lot of data, like cameras. Instead of needing to stream real-time video from several cameras continuously, with an embedded or edge AI system, the majority of the data is kept locally reducing the bandwidth connection to the cloud. A third benefit is that it's more robust to connection outages. Since you don't need to send as much data to the cloud, or as often, 
temporary internet outages can have less of an impact on how the system runs. And finally, a fourth benefit is data protection. Since the majority of the data is kept locally, you have more control over how that data is protected. You're not sending it out over the internet or storing it on third-party servers. All right, so perhaps now you're convinced of the importance of edge and embedded AI. The question now is, is developing AI for an embedded or edge processor really any different than developing AI that just runs on the cloud? Well, in general, the workflow is the same, but the difficult parts of it and where you're spending most of your effort might be different. So let me explain it with an example workflow for supervised learning. To develop an AI model, you start by identifying a problem that you want to solve and importantly are able to solve with AI. You determine what type of data you need to solve this problem and then collect and clean a large training data set. You choose a model architecture and train the model to maximize accuracy. And then you use that model to classify unseen data to validate that the algorithm is working, at least in a lab setting. Now, model accuracy is not the only design objective. So then you might optimize the algorithm for compute speed and memory size to run it on your target hardware. And to get it on that hardware, you might need to translate the model from a high level language like Python or MATLAB to a low level language like C. And finally, you make sure nothing functional has changed in the translated model while running on the hardware and in the real world setting. And by the way, this isn't necessarily a linear workflow where every step is done just once and then you move on. There's plenty of points where you have to iterate on the design and go back to change previous things. All right, so this isn't a complete workflow, but I'm hoping it gives you an idea of just the general steps involved. All right, so let's talk about the differences in this workflow between cloud-based AI and embedded and edge AI. And like I said before, the workflow for the most part is the same but where you spend more of your time might be different. For edge and embedded AI, these last few steps can take up a larger portion of your relative workload. So for the rest of this video, I wanna talk about what makes these steps harder for these applications and how you can approach designing edge and embedded AI in a way that simplifies the process as much as possible. And the first thing that I wanna cover is this step of validating your model in the lab. And something to keep in mind is that your AI models often have to work with other software and hardware in a complex engineering system. For example, for a virtual sensor that's estimating battery state of charge using an AI model, you should develop and test that model with an understanding of the battery itself and the loads on that battery and how they change over time and things like how the other battery management software interacts with that model. And in this way, part of validating the overall design is simulating the system and verifying that it works in all situations with all of the other components. And personally speaking, as a controls engineer who usually does most of my development in Simulink, I like a workflow where I can take my existing dynamics model, like I'm showing here with a battery and a battery management system, and then test out different methods for estimating the state of charge. In this example, there are non-AI methods like Coulomb counting and a Kalman filter, as well as an AI model in the form of a forward neural network. And this network could be developed in MATLAB or just pulled in from Python using a library like PyTorch or TensorFlow. And then from here, I can now simulate the entire system, including the AI portion, to determine which method is best and that the estimation works with all of the other components. And I think that the more tightly your AI model development is woven into the broader system design, the more seamless and reliable your verification process will be. All right, moving on from validation in a lab setting, let's talk about fitting the model onto the target processor. And the unfortunate reality of edge and embedded AI is that you're often working with resource limited hardware. This means that you need to put in effort to optimize your model for the hardware by making it smaller, faster, and more efficient in terms of compute, memory, and power. And there's a few strategies for this. Sometimes you go back and change the architecture itself, maybe simplifying layers or reducing parameters in a deep network, or seeing if you can get away with a simpler machine learning model, like a decision tree. 
Other times you take a trained model and apply techniques like pruning, quantization, or projection-based compression to reduce its footprint without sacrificing too much accuracy. And there's a really good MATLAB example showing how powerful projection compression is for compressing a model while maintaining accuracy. I think it's worth checking out, so I'll leave it in the description below. All right, once the model is optimized for the hardware, the next challenge is just getting it to run on the target processor. And this is where the translation step becomes critical. Unlike cloud-based AI, where you might run MATLAB or Python code directly on a general purpose operating system, embedded AI usually has to be converted into something that can run on bare metal or within a constrained real-time operating system. This might be C code, or it could be HDL for an FPGA, or CUDA for a GPU. This is where it's beneficial to develop your AI and other software components in a way that allows for automatic translation into the low-level software directly. In this way, the model can stay the same, and then you generate production-level code for whichever target processor your model will run on. And here, I'm just generating code for an NVIDIA Jetson as just an example. And you can see in the generated code, the functions being called that correspond to the different layers in the network, like pooling and 2D convolution and et cetera. Now, this workflow has the added benefit of allowing you to change which processor you generate code for, which can be important for keeping up with the design changes as the program is trying to figure out which processor is needed to run everything and fit within the constraints of the device. Finally, many edge and embedded AI applications must operate in safety critical environments where the goal extends beyond just functionally working, but to include things like robustness and predictability and trustworthiness under all operating conditions. And there's many ways to approach this. And often you have to employ multiple different techniques to meet the requirements necessary for certifying your system. But some key approaches include things like out of distribution detection or OOD. One of the first lines of defense is ensuring the model only processes inputs that are similar to those that it was trained on. Now, here in Simulink, I have a runtime OOD detection algorithm that produces a score based on how closely the inputs match the inputs that the model was trained on. And if the score falls outside of some threshold, the in distribution flag is set to zero, and then downstream, the system knows not to use the output of the AI model for that sample time. And here you can see that as I run this simulation, most of the data is in distribution, but due to some noise in the system, occasionally the inputs fall outside of the trusted range and the in distribution flag is set to zero, where temporarily the system can now fall back to a safe rule-based controller. Another critical approach involves verifying that the model exhibits stability properties, such as Lipschitz continuity or bounded sensitivity where small changes in input lead to small predictable changes in the output. You know, what you don't want is for your model that does a good job of predicting on clean data to just suddenly misclassify slightly noisy data. And there's formal verification techniques that can be used to mathematically guarantee that these small input perturbations aren't going to drastically affect the output, which increases confidence that the model isn't going to respond erratically to these minor perturbations. And lastly, prior knowledge about the physical system can be encoded directly into the model through constraints. And these might include enforcing monotonicity or convexity or maximum gradient limits or just adherence to physical conservation laws. And such constraints not only improve generalization, but also ensure that the model respects known properties of the environment. And with all of these types of approaches, it becomes easier to demonstrate and prove that your system will behave reliably on the physical system, even in edge cases where failures aren't acceptable. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna leave this short introduction. I hope this has given you a better understanding of embedded and edge AI, but also some of the practical challenges associated with designing these systems. And I've left links below to several MATLAB examples demonstrating many of the things that I talked about in this video if you want to try it out yourself. Thanks for sticking around to the end. If you enjoyed this explanation, you can find all of the Tech Talk videos across many different topics nicely organized at mathworks.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.